Cool. So today I'm going to be talking about autonomous passage planning for a polar vessel. Uh, this is um, the, the SDA that many of you will know. Uh, this is the main drive for this uh, first stage of the project, but I'm actually going to be showing a lot of work today on routing for uh, marine gliders. And this is very recent work that we've been doing. And you can see the things kind of starting to tie together and how this is done in the broader picture. But just to give a brief background, so I'm part of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at BASS. Uh, we've got four main themes that we kind of investigate. And the environmental imagery, so that's using machine learning methods to uh, identify key features in environmental um, critical areas. So this could be from migrationary patterns of caribou to density um, understanding of um, stuff like seals. There's a lot in the environmental prediction side of things. So this is how can we look going forward using machine learning and how the environment is changing. But the, the portion that I'm under is the autonomous marine planning. So this is how do we optimize routing for different marine uh, assets like ships and gliders and uh, AUVs to automation. So how do we do planning across field seasons and then optimizing this for a minimization of uh, carbon usage? And then all of these, these three key areas are underpinned by a digital infrastructure, which is the requirement of software engineers, uh, pipelining, geospatial data, uh, notebooks and APIs. So we initially started just over a year and a half ago. Um, Professor Maria Fox is the one that started the Autonomous Marine Planning Group. Uh, started with one person with Maria. She was in polar oceans, but she's now expanded to our team, which is shown on screen now. So this is only one pro portion of the AI lab. Um, we're primarily funded under a decarbonization fund, as Danny stated. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's supplying all of us funding up to 2025. But more, more recently, we started to work more closely with other members in Bass. So we're working with the Polar Oceans team, and many of the work shown today was done uh, in collaboration with this group. So this is my biggest tech slide, and I'm uh, not going to go into too much detail on this, but just to say why we're doing this and what we're actually doing. Uh, so NERC has set a net zero goal by 2040. So any scientific task that's undertaken in Bass has to be net zero to be funded. And the other additional uh, carbon requirement is by 2025, they're expecting a 25% reduction in carbon usage. So to meet these demands, we have to drastically reduce our carbon cost across all avenues of uh, polar research. And it, to kind of put this in another perspective, 60% of, of NERC's carbon usage is in the ship alone, or it's in its three ships, which is the um, uh, Sir David Attenborough, the Discovery, and the James Cook. So we have undertaken a project to investigate developing AI and ML techniques uh, to provide decision support for marine operations to minimize this fuel usage across all of its marine vehicles. Uh, to think of this in another way, it's not just minimizing fuel that the ship would take, but also looking at things slightly differently and saying, well, could we do all these uh, different research avenues using gliders or using AUVs? So at the moment, we separated up into three main sections uh, of our project. We've got our long distance route planner, which I'll discuss primarily today. But then we've got um, in ice uh, risk aware and navigation. And then finally, the more recent work that we've been doing is uh, AI task planning. So to put this in a more everyday analogy, uh, our first thing, our long distance route planner called Polar Route is very similar to an in-car navigation system. So like you would now get into your car and you uh, start up Google Maps, it now gives you the most fuel efficient route and the most uh, the quickest route between you and some given location. But unlike that, we don't really have a road system in the um, polar oceans and we have a strongly changing dynamic condition of sea ice, uh, currents, um, different bathymetry for different vehicles, um, sorry, different uh, beams for different vehicles. So we need to kind of build upon previous work in that and then also leverage all these different types of information that we need for the vehicles. The second stage of our projects is actually a in ice navigation. So this is kind of similar to Tesla's autopilot. So when you're doing this lane departure side of things, um, you're considering the risk of taking that action uh, relative to things moving around you. So what we're actually looking at is using a machine learning emulation problem to try and uh, understand how the sea ice conditions are changing and give routes that are then dependent on the lowest risk. 
So I won't discuss that work today because that's only really very recent work, but I'd love to discuss that in the future. Uh, and the final uh, portion of these three main sections is our AI task planning. Now, this is very similar to like Amazon delivery logistics. So how do we get a package to a person? Which, uh, which different cargo lorry should it go on? But unlike that kind of Amazon delivery logistics, we have the complexity that many of the places that we're delivering could be mobile themselves. It could be a ship coming to pick up a glider. So it's, it, if to put it in an analogy, uh, the Royal Mail used to deliver packages onto moving trains. It's the same kind of problem there. Um, but to, to go through what we'll discuss today, we're gonna go through one, the first section, which is our polar route work. So uh, yeah, I, I will very quickly uh, go through some of this. It's still quite a lot of information, uh, but we're trying to do route planning in a really complex dynamic condition. And I'll show this with some pictures in a second. In a second. Um, what we need to be doing for this is to create a digital environment using a diverse range of data sets that is non-uniform and is uh, discretized in some form. So to reduce the computational cost of route planning. But these routes that we determine must be physics uh, aware. Uh, they must be smoothed such that if there was no environmental conditions, they would follow the curvature of the Earth or the Great Circle. Um, this isn't just a scientific research project, though. We're actually in the stage of operationalization on many of the NERC ships. We're starting to implement uh, the same route planning work for autonomous vehicles, which I'll show today. And then the next stage for that one is to then have a toolkit with the uh, autonomous uh, vehicle teams can actually use to minimize uh, battery usage or actually inform the ship where to pick them up. So what are we doing? So the first stage is to create a meshed digital representation of our, our environment. Um, so what we're taking is several different types of data sets. So this could be marine currents, stuff like um, SOSI uh, current data, to sea ice concentrations, say from data sets like AMSR, Bathymetrics, um, we could also take winds, which we're now using, uh, the ice thickness, which could be taken from um, cryosat. And all these different data sets are then discretized into this mesh where the size of the cell in the mesh is dependent on the variability or the, the variance in the data sets inside that box. So that form the first section of our problem where we're taking all these different data sets, they could be forecasts, like we're now using our sea ice forecasts from machine learning methods like IceNet. We then create a digital representation of what the environment looks like before applying a vessel specific characteristic. And I'll show this with an example in a minute, uh, which we then apply uh, route planning using this vessel environment to then get the, the optimal route between a given location and a destination. So Let's take this, this kind of digital environment that we've initially generated. So on this, I've only shown the, the land, which is represented in black, and the sea ice concentration, which is shown in these purples. So you can see it's in a very discretized form, um, but you can see the higher the purple, the higher the sea ice concentration. And this is from January earlier this year. So if we looked into one of these cell boxes, we would have characteristics so that could be the sea ice concentration, the current um, that drives this, the depth from the bathymetrics, it could be wind, wave, and we, we make it such that uh, users can put in any information that they want from this, and all you have to do is understand how that would affect the ship characteristics. So the next stage is the ship sees that environment di very differently to um, the different environmental data sets. So for example, we have a, a good understanding for our flagship ship, the Sir David Attenborough, what its fuel usage will be in different sea ice concentrations. So what we're seeing on this map here is a color map where you see the higher the red color, the higher the fuel usage. And even these areas of solid red are areas of inaccessible ice, so areas where the sea ice concentration is too high for the ship to enter, so it become beset. And you can see that it has these interesting effects that around the edge of the ice, you actually have a large fuel usage because you go very quick through them, but there is um, a resistive force against the ship. So now we have these vehicle specific characteristics from the mesh that are applied on top of this environmental mesh. So now each of these cell boxes have the addition of the ice resistance to the ship, the maximum speed that it could do in the cell box and its fuel consumption. So using all this information, we can then uh, use graphical based AI tools to then construct the quickest 
or the most fuel uh, efficient routes from a given location to a series of destinations. So these routes here are shown as the optimal transit time routes. And you can see that this is from a starting position of the SDA in January this year to a series of possible locations. But the interesting thing is you can change the objective function. So you could say, well, I don't want to go the quickest route. I now want to go for the route that minimizes the fuel usage. So this is an example where we go from the position close to Halley here, WP1, to the end location of WP2. There's two different routes here. There's one that's the most fuel efficient route, which is showing the one that's more um, risk aware around the, uh, the sea ice. And then the other one is the most, uh, the quickest route. And we then get metrics of how much time saving there could be by taking the, um, the quickest route relative to the fuel cost by doing that. Okay, so that was for the SDA though, but the whole framework that we're developing takes in uh, the vehicle's response in the environment. So we can change how the vehicle responds. We can say, well, its maximum speed isn't the SDA, it's actually that of a marine glider. Um, it has no fuel usage, but it has a battery consumption that's dependent on the, the depth of the environment. And it's driven more strongly by the, the currents in the environment. So for what's shown on screen here, we take our original meshed environment, but we now apply a very different vehicle characteristic, which is shown in the middle, middle column, where we cannot go close to sea ice. So we have a maximum threshold of the sea ice, which is showing these really dark red areas. But the, the battery usage is just dependent on the bathymetric. So you can see that close to the um, Antarctic Peninsula, you've got a high battery usage, but then when you go into open waters, um, it's lower. But in this case, the maximum speed of the vehicle is much, much slower. So if we plot the currents on top of this, we can see that maybe it will be driven more by the, the currents um, as it navigates between a start point and an end point. So if we looked at this um, and actually created the routes, so we're now doing a from Rothra to Port Stanley and from Port Stanley to Rothra, but now doing the quickest route and the most um, battery um, reducing routes, then you can see that actually when you go from Rothra to Stanley, you follow very closely the currents because they're giving you that little push forward. And when you're coming back from Stanley, uh, because these currents are so strong for the marine gliders, you actually uh, still use them, but you try and hug in as close as you can to the peninsula so you don't have that strong um, uh, forcing uh, back on the glider. But when you're looking at the battery one, because there's this really high battery use is close to the coast because it can't do its full thousand meter dive. Um, you actually go out further from the coastline, hug up to the north, and then um, go around this kind of like hump in the bathymetrics before going into Stanley. But again, you're, you're fighting against the currents as you're coming back to Rothra. So these represent the routes for the quickest and the lowest battery usage. We can then get the, the metrics out of this. So if we looked at the quickest routes, we would see it's 51 days from Rothra to Stanley, but returning from, um, sorry, from the Falklands to Rothra, that's a typo, it's 91 days. And the battery usage is very different because you're going against the currents. And similarly, you can do the same for um, the, the lowest battery routes. So they're, they're slightly longer in transit time, but they're reducing the total battery usage. And then the metric distance uh, differences, you can see that by taking the battery route, you're actually saving four days. Uh, it's four days slower, but you're only saving 38 amp hours of battery. And then if you're going back from the Falklands to Rothra, um, it's nine days longer and you're only saving 36 amp hours. But that's only one characteristic of these, these gliders. What happens when things go a bit wrong? So if we, if we have these as our our environmental routes that we were considering taking, we now start to undertake that route. And then we say during that transit, something goes wrong and the, the glider becomes unresponsive. Uh, it drops its mass, its weight, and it bobs up to the surface. It's still detectable, it's still sampling, um, but it's now has to, it doesn't have any propulsion and it's gliding based on the currents. So we can, we can change the vehicle characteristics to say, at this point, uh, 40 days into its transit, it failed. It then followed the, the currents. And we can say, where will it be in 60 days time? And we can then play the game of, well, can we 
if we pick that up, how much additional fuel would it cost for, say, the ship to pick that glider up? So on this plot here, we've got a transit between Port Stanley and Rothera for the ship. Um, and we're saying that transit was already planned. It was considering to uh, do a redeployment at Port uh, Rothera, um, giving supplies. How much additional fuel usage would it cost to then go pick up that glider? And how much additional time are you costing to pick it up? So the time is only almost two hours addition. It's about two tons of fuel, uh, which is about six tons of TCO2E. So in a broader perspective down the down the line or where we're looking at in the uh, next five to 10 years is, can this all be put into an optimization scheme where if something does go wrong, we can then work out the lowest fuel cost to pick it up at some other point in the season or possibly the next season. And then finally, what I've shown you today is kind of, although it's on a discrete, discrete map that's kind of encompassing a time average representation of the environment, in the other project that we're doing, that we are actually looking at um, time varying environments, so routing as the environment is changing. And that work that we're doing in that problem will actually be leveraged into this work. So instead of seeing these static current fields, you'll see the the um, the gyres kind of moving as we have forecasts of those kind of environmental variables. And in addition, we've only really shown in this talk um, a marine glider example, but everything is very transferable in this open source toolkit. So an expert could come in and say, I want to do that for our brand new vehicle. It has these characteristics. What would the routing look like? And we're, we're trying to make this more freely available for people to change and happy to work with people to put in new type of assets. And then finally, um, I showed the routes for the, the SDA ship with these very smooth effects. We're still um, dealing with a couple of the kinks, um, no pun intended, uh, on the, the glider-based examples due to the massively reduced um, maximum speed, but we're expecting to get this work done within the next half year, so that won't take too long at all. So just to go back to our big overview, uh, I know I talked through quite quickly our long distance route planning, but that is only the first stage. The next stages are we're doing this in ice navigation, which could also be used for uh, in ice um, surfacing for gliders, for example, or how you would take an AUV into ice conditions. So that work will be completely transferable and could be changed for a different asset. And then finally, our AI task planning is already in these stages where we're starting to work with the marine planning um, groups at BAS to look at ways that we can optimize when would we do a scientific task? Should we wait half a season when the ice is less in that area? Or could that be done by a glider? Um, what do you lose for your scientific gain from that? So that's the kind of the broader perspective that all of these things will flow upstream meaning that our long distance route planning will then have a risk aware um, navigation in addition to being used in our task planning and could be leveraged across multiple uh, institutions and uh, multiple uh, research areas.